Welcome, everyone. Welcome aboard the citizenship. I say that because uh, we're all deep in admiralty jurisdiction. And uh, so, how many people here could tell me? We're going to start with um, the notion of transport tonight, because transport's a favourite one of mine. How many people can tell me what they think transport really means? A means to get from A to B, maybe? Good. Well, mechanised transport, vehicles, etc. Okay, vehicles. Just a means to get around. Okay. So, transport, let's take it apart. Transport. Everything in this world is based on this uh, admiralty jurisdiction. It's all to do with the high seas. Vessels, uh, ports, and uh, all of those laws are all basically laws and jurisdictions that come from England originally and are copyrighted, uh, I believe, to the Bar Association or something like that in England. So once you move over the seas, uh, it falls into admiralty jurisdiction. So when you go into some of the, the courts and you see flags that have, you know, like this uh, trim on them, this gold trim, you're actually in an admiralty court. So it's, uh, it becomes a, something like the high seas here. Now... Transport is the transfer between two ports. So what are, you, what are we transferring here? What are we transporting? Well, Usually, people. Yeah, we're, we're actually transporting people. The people themselves are the goods. They're the cargo. So the vehicle or the vessel actually becomes, you know, uh, the road actually becomes like the, uh, the shipping lane. And so... You actually transfer something from one port to another port, and it's regulated by the transport you know, the department of transport. Right? So, where does this all leave us? Well, we we have these things called vehicles that we're told are vehicles are you know are private automobiles. What they really are are another type of vehicle or vessel to ship around the straw men. So, you know, we all have our straw men. Does anyone here not know? What the straw man is? I'm not that clear on no. what the Okay, okay. Well, the straw man is probably the first place we should start. The straw man is your front. He's the all capital letter fiction that uh, the governments and corporations create. This is all, this is where the matrix comes in. Like, there's the natural world, and there's the machine world, and the machine world, the digital world, emulates the natural world. It's, it's the hidden world, and it emulates it in three ways, and that's with uh, electricity, water, and salt. They're the three basic constituents of all life, and the, uh, the machine world emulates that. And so you have admiralty jurisdiction, you have, uh, you have circuit courts, you have charges, you have discharges, uh, and, and all of the other elements that make up this machine world are based on the natural world. And so it's, uh, it's this kind of duplicate so that we don't actually see it or know that it's there. So your straw man, this, this all capital letter fiction, is created. When you're birthed, okay, when, when you come down the birth canal, you know, out of one vessel, you're basically docked. Uh, you know, the cargo is uh, unladen and you're registered. Uh, the, uh, the cargo is now um, in a new port, let's say. So you are registered with the government and you get a number and you get a, you're assigned an all capital letter version of yourself, the digital you. Okay, not the natural you. This is the digital you. And what the government does is it takes that, uh, takes that digital you and it creates an account. And that account is called the, the straw man. And the government uses that account as your, it takes, actually takes out a, uh, a loan and it becomes a record of your future earnings. So, you know, throughout your life, your straw man will be the transmitting utility through which all commerce takes place in your incarnated form on this planet. Okay. So every time that you move around or do anything or go out in public or go to a shopping center, a center of commerce or any of those things, or drive or put into motion... Uh, an automobile, or in this case uh, a vessel or a vehicle, 
you're actually complying with, or you know, you might have to go out and get a license and apply for a license. And all these things are regulated, but they are all public, and they are all uh, a part of this system. They are nothing to do with the private realm, which is what you see outside. Parked outside is my private automobile. Okay. Now the private automobile isn't registered to the government because it's mine. Now if you notice on everyone's license plate you'll see a number and you'll see a state because it's licensed to a state within a government. So it's a particular allocation. Okay. Now all of those vehicles that you see on the road are commercial whether they tell you that or whether they're not but they're all commercial because when you drive that's a commercial activity. You actually put into motion a commercial vehicle for the purpose of transporting one cargo or one person. What you're actually transporting is that straw man. You're responsible for that straw man. So when you see an ambulance racing down the road to save somebody, they're not going to save you. They're actually going to make sure that, that straw man is looked after because that transmitting utility is the real money that the governments have. That's the collateral that they use. They don't have any money. There is no money. It's, you know, if you think there's any money, we're going we're to look at that right now, and we're going to show you that there actually is no money, and uh, you're going to see that we, our labour, is the thing that actually the, the government um, holds as mm. its collateral, and so we become. Um, if, if you travel overseas, for example, I'm going to go. Would you be able to get my uh, my port pass? Yeah. It's, it's on the desk. Let's, let's get the port yeah. pass. Yeah. How many of you have a port pass? Passport. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The passport, disguised. The port pass disguised as a passport. Mm -hmm. Okay. The port pass is your documentation, which allows your straw person. To go to another country as a foreign exchange. Okay, you become the self-loading baggage when you go to a a seaport or an airport, and you board a commercial airline. Okay, you take your straw man, and you show your your details, your credentials, and it's an exchange. Okay, there's a commodity, and it's being exchanged with another country. So of course, you know, there's all these regulations and things. Now, what I've done. Just, just pass this around and have a look. And tell me if you notice anything at all different about my port pass. Now, while that's being passed around, I'll, uh, I'm going to write down here something on this, this bit of um, this paper here. So this little, bit, little piece of paper here is going to be money. This is going to become currency. And I'm going to write down here $1,000, and I'm going to... Pass that over there. There we go. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to write down on this piece of paper here uh, $100, and I'm going to give that to you as well. Right. Now, I'm going to ask you to sign your name on this piece of paper. And what we're going to do here is we're going to, we're going to break down this interesting signature. Okay, and you hang on to that, and uh, you give me back the, the $1,000 piece of paper. Right. What we're going to do here is we're going to create a little bit of a, a credit card facility here. Right. Let's say our friend over here, I'm going to be the credit card facility, the credit card provider. I could be GE, I could be any one of a number of corporations. Uh, this person believes that money is real. So he's going to come to me and ask me for $1,000 credit so that he can go out and perhaps purchase something else, which he doesn't, he doesn't actually realize has already been paid for. It's actually prepaid, because it, everything is prepaid by the labor of the people who create it. Right? Mm -hmm. We're not actually paid with anything of any value. And here's the point. There is no lawful money in circulation backed by anything of value. Okay? There's no lawful money in circulation backed by anything of value. It's all fiat. And so you never actually receive anything of value. You never get paid. And so if you never get paid, where's the taxable event? There isn't one. So, 
you're going to come to me and ask me for a thousand dollars of credit. So I'm going to offer you this credit card. Thank you very much. And I'd like to take from you your negotiable instrument. So could you please hand me your signature? Oh, you don't want the hundred dollars? No, not yet. All oh, right. Yeah. I'm going to take the only thing of value that any of us actually have, which is his signature. So I've got this piece of paper now with his value, his signature, which is the thing that creates all value. And I am going to take it and I'm going to on-sell that original document to another company. Right. So it's gone. The original debt instrument has gone. And they're going to give me back whatever. They might give me um, $800. Okay, but they just bought his so-called debt. Now, what did you get? You got 1,000 credits. Ones and zeros on uh, some computer somewhere. Okay. It didn't come out of my pocket. I just punched in some numbers on the computer. Okay. I didn't actually uh, go and get any gold and give you something like that of any value. I just punched in some numbers on the computer. So, the debt settled. Uh, I don't have any um, bank balance problem or anything like that. Okay, so my debt's gone. I don't actually hold the original debt instrument anymore, so I don't really have any right to ask you to repay me that 1,000 credits. But I'm going to. Okay, so could you give me back the 1,000 credits, please? Wouldn't I get my signature back? No, not at all. Do you ever get your signature back when you sign a contract or something? Well, in some sense of being unobligated to pay any more interest or anything to do with that debt, yes. Uh, once, the, once, the, uh, once the interest has been paid, the... But the without being ordinary, you can have your... Sure, sure. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take back the thousand credits that, um, that I gave him. Now, I'd also like a little bit extra for my time. So can I have the hundred dollars that I've just written out there for you as well? Do you mind if I, I have that? Do you really have to have it all? Sure, yeah. I, I really need <coughs> it all. What if I tore it in half and only gave the fifty back? I like money. I, I like money, so I'll, yeah. I'll take I'll take yeah. it. So I really shouldn't be cantankerous, I should just give it back to you. Yeah, because that's what it's we do. It's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. You should because yeah. otherwise I'll have to send you like a... Get uh, bad credit. Uh, uh, you'll never be able to... You, you'll you get like a bad credit house. rating if, if yeah. you don't give me that. Yes. Problems, problems. So problems. I'm going to hang on to that. Okay, now, they've got your signature and I've got this $1,000 back. What have you got? Probably about oh, 500 Pepsis. Okay, and where are they now? Mostly gone, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> they don't yeah. So they're sort of being distributed amongst friends and. Did and um, and stuff. do you, do you have anything now of, of any intrinsic value that represents the original amount? Not in concrete value, but I've probably got a lot of goodwill from giving away lots of Pepsi's. To sure, people. sure. Okay. So as you can see, what's actually happened here is that um, not only have I not had the right to ask for that money back. I've taken some more, what, what you would call real money. I actually took a hundred dollars of, of, of his real money, okay. And so what you see here is is the, the fiat money system going on, okay. So we don't actually receive anything of value. So when you get taxed, there's no taxable event because you haven't received anything of value. Even if you went out and bought a motor car, you know, you, let's say you uh, you got paid, you got your, your, your paycheck, and you went out and bought a motor car, you say, well. You know, I got a loan and I went out and bought a motor car. Now, what happens? You go and try and sell that motor car now. How much are you going to get for it? Probably l less than half of... Way what, less, yeah. yeah. I mean, the minute you drive out that car yard, if you drive it back in and try to sell it to them, you know, there'd be at least $2,000 off the, the price, at least. No, okay. More. It'd more. be more. Because because there's no intrinsic value. And also, that uh, that vehicle is already prepaid for doesn't have any value, okay. So what you see there is um, is the basic thing of, of what happens every day. You know, we, we hand around all these pieces of money and it only takes, you know, the, the, the International Monetary Fund to say, okay, the value of that is nothing. And in 
and it's not backed by anything. So it's not backed by gold. So well, it's way more evident when you get a home loan and just go on the internet banking and it just appears there from nowhere. Where did that money come from? Where does it come exactly. from? Isn't, yeah. isn't doesn't all the money the banks have have to be backed by gold in the Federal Reserve? No, not at all. It's fractional banking, so they can lend up to uh, was it ninety percent more. So for every dollar they can lend out nine. They so only have to keep ten percent. Yeah, they only have to keep ten percent. That's yeah. that's the fractional banking. Yeah. So no, there's there's not enough gold in the world to support all of the um, the debt that's in the world. So everyone is bankrupt. All of the governments are bankrupt, and uh, it's all just a big game at the moment to see you know how how bankrupt they can become before the house of cards falls down. Mm. Yeah, it's a very scary thing. And I, I actually think that 2008 will see the end of the U.S. dollar because they are so far in debt, so many trillions of dollars mm. in debt that they can never ever ever recover. So what they do is they take us, or moreover, they actually take our straw man, and they own us. So they, they own us. And that's why they can do what the hell they want. That, that's why we are not allowed to complain. People always talk about rights. You know, I've got the right to do this, I've got the right to do that. Mm. What are my constitution rights? You know, that's bullshit. None of, that's, none of that exists. N- none of these rights actually exist. Because we've given them up, and we give, we gave them up when we when we uh, agreed to be the straw man. So how did we agree to be the straw man? Now you'll notice on mine. Did anyone notice? Pick up yeah, the, the agent. Mm. Okay, I'm the agent right. for the all capital letter fiction known as the straw man. You'll notice this all capital letter version, not of my name, because. If this was an all capitalization of my name, it would still be my name. What this is, is, is it's an all capital letter legal fiction trademark that I own that happens to look like my name. Very important. And I am the agent for it. Now, it could say Pepsi-Cola. It could say McDonald's. And I would be the agent for it. And I actually do own... A, uh, a trademark which looks like my name and so it can be very confusing for some people now I'm going to show you one other thing here <clears throat> here is my bank card now pass that around and have a look and see what the name is on that and don't read it out because I'm Agent J tonight but mm-hmm. you'll notice the letters TM after it mm. okay now, most of us, when we get a credit card or a bill or anything like that, we're asked to sign our name to it. So we do. Okay, so we, we sign our name on the back. And you'll notice on the back of that one, it actually says authorized agent or agent on the back of it. Okay, because I'm signing as the agent for the fiction. I'm not the fiction. Okay, I'm not Pepsi Cola. Okay, I'm not McDonald's. And neither are the people who own it. So I own the straw man. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's, that's very, very important. And that's the thing that we all need to do, is we all need to become the agent for the straw man rather than the straw man itself, because then we take away the liability. We actually put a, uh, a fictional entity between us as natural flesh and blood beings and the machine. Because the machine only recognises all capital letter legal fiction trademark corporations or corporate souls. We're all corporate souls. Now, does anyone here have a credit card or any other thing on them? Any other identifying uh, piece of corporate stuff? Yeah. If you have, just just lay them out on the floor there and we're just going to have a look. I'm not going to read them. We're not going to mention anyone's names here. I just want you all to see exactly who you are. Whatever you've got, lay them all out there. Let's have a look at them. <laughs> Joey, <laughs> you've been collecting, <laughs> accumulating. Oh, my. Okay, so let's have a look here. We've got an all cap fiction. An MP3. Okay. Now, okay. what you've done here, what you've done here, every time that you've signed your name on one of these cards, you have done what's what's known in the legal world as enjoining, and you you probably hear that in like um, the courts a lot. Enjoining, and by signing your name, 
you've agreed to be the all capital letter legal fiction. So you become responsible for it. You, you are now licensed. That's your license. So you have the capacity to drive a commercial vehicle and to transport other entities because that's what you are. You're an entity. You all are entities, believe it or not. Okay. This is corporations law. It's un- if you if you get out the corporations act and have a have a good read of it, that's where all law comes from. It's all in there. Okay. All that stuff applies only to corporations. Now, I decided to challenge the taxation department. So I put together a very very well researched um, twenty questions and, and went along to the um, the head of the taxation department. And he could only answer three of them. Okay. And basically, he hadn't read the Corporations Act, thought that it was irrelevant. And so I said to him, well, if I was to actually come along and sign up and, and you know, become a, a business, um, what would be my, you know, uh, what would I become? And he said, well, you know, you, you would become a sole trader. And that is a really interesting term, you know, sole trader. And what that generally means, um, and he hadn't, he didn't know this, but in the Corporations Act, a sole trader is a member organization, a member organization of a securities exchange. That's the definition. Okay, stock exchange. A member organization of a securities exchange. So when you become a sole trader, you actually sign up and you get a, an ABN number and you get a tax file number, and your all capital letter fiction will be registered. And if you sign your name to it, you enjoin and you become, and that's how you become liable for tax. That's how they get you. Because corporations are liable to tax. Mm. Okay, You can't tax a natural flesh and blood being because there's a hierarchy. For those who, who believe in a, in a god or the universe or whatever uh, all that there is, that all that there is creates us and we create governments, and we create legal fictions that create laws. There's a hierarchy system, and the way that this is structured is that one of those things can't step above the other one. We can't step up and tell the universe or God or whoever created all this stuff what to do. Same, a government or a fiction can't step up and tell a natural flesh and blood being what to do, but it can tell another entity. And so, in order to get us into control, into subversion, the governments must get us to become an all capital letter legal fiction. And that's what all of you are. So that's what, I was, that's what I'm saying. And does that happen at birth or does it happen when you become... It usually happens at birth. With a birth certificate. Yeah, right? because that birth certificate is what registers you and creates the account and allows them to take out a bond and they, they register that bond that goes on the stock market. It, it might get pulled with a whole lot of other bonds. So this process that you've gone through, can you start that as your, with your ch- when your child is born? Can you yeah, tell absolutely. Them, can you start off by saying they, they're not an entity and they're not going to have a birth certificate? Well, one of the, th- one of the things we're going to look at tonight is, um, is argument, because, because argument is, um, is part of this system called honour and dishonour. And this, this whole kind of like weird legal system that operates, operates under four basic premises. And the first one is called uh, silence. Okay? And silence is dishonorable. Okay? That's dishonor. You have the right to remain silent. They're telling you that you have the right to remain silent. Now, perhaps as an entity you do, right? But there's an assumption there. Now, if you stay silent, silent is uh, a dishonor. When you dishonor the court, what happens? They throw you in jail or, you know, bad stuff happens, right? Number two is argument. Okay, argument is also dishonor. You can't argue with the the policeman. You can't argue with the judge, right? Because it's dishonorable. That's where it splits. Number three is acceptance. I accept what I did. I take full responsibility for my actions. That's honourable, okay? But it can get you into trouble, sure, because then you become liable for everything that you do. And in the legal world, you don't want to be liable for all of this uh, fictitious stuff. So we have number four, which is the 
It's the acceptance. It's the conditional acceptance. There it is. Conditional. Okay. So we have conditional acceptance. I accept what you're saying for value and consideration upon proof of claim. Bang. So let's say um, let's say you're the judge. Okay. We go into this fictitious Alice in Wonderland court, and there's a charge. So here we are. We're in a circuit court, and uh, there's there's a charge. Okay. Because at the moment the court is dead. So get get this right. The court is dead. It cannot move. And a a court has to move in order to do anything, right? And so when you go into the court, the court doesn't actually have any jurisdiction over you. And not many people realize that, okay? They've been given a summons or a a present, okay? They've been given a presentment to come along and and appear. But what happened? You know, you went out to the, the mailbox and there was a letter. And on the letter... It looked like your name, but but was it really your name? It was actually addressed to the all capital letter legal fiction, wasn't it? And so you opened that letter, and in in opening the letter, you accepted that you are the all capital letter legal fiction. You enjoined again, because it's illegal to open another person's um, mail, right? So you opened it up, and and here's a summons, and you know it might have this all capital letter legal fiction that kind of looks like your name written on it and you go oh shit looks like I've done something wrong and I'm going to have to go to court on this day so you turn up at the court and um, okay you can be the judge today what would be the first thing that the judge would say to me if I was sitting in the in the courtroom could be a myriad of things I'm not sure because it would depend on the circumstances what would be the, the very first I've thing I've been to a court and I'll see you now. That's yeah. State, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. The, actually, probably the first thing they would do. Yeah. The, the, the first thing they would probably do is to ask you to stand up. All rise. Okay. Please stand. Mm-hmm. And if you conform with that, you give up your rights instantly. You become subject to their jurisdiction of this fictitious court because you've given away all of your natural common law rights just by doing what the judge said to do without any argument or anything like that. So the judge says, you know, please stand, and everybody stands, okay, and, and that's it. He, he'll then ask you for your name, because that's the important thing, because what he's actually reading is the presentment. And so he's looking at the all capital letter legal fiction, and he's saying, uh, Mr. Anderson, you know, Please state your name, uh, you know, and you say, uh, Mr. Anderson. And that's it. He's got you because you've then become the legal fiction again that's on his, um, his presentment. At, at that point, he can do whatever the hell he wants to, to you. So by not standing and not saying anything, if one actually showed up at a court, what would happen? One, yeah, what, what are the implications of that? If you didn't stand up, you and, would actually... And refuse to say <coughs> Sure, that'd be number two. That'd be number two here. That would be argument, or it could be silence. If you sat there and did nothing, that'd be dishonour. Okay, you'd be uh, in the implications of being dishonoured or in a dishonouring situation. Yeah, uh, could be quite very bad. Seemed guilty. Yeah, this is not a position you want to be in. Okay, you you don't want to be dishonouring. You don't want to be silence, because silence is tacit agreement. Okay, silence is agreement in law. It's an assumption, yes, but silence is agreement. Mm. So is there any other... I'm just, I'm just trying to um, see what other... Well, I've never been in this situation, so I don't know. Sure. I've well, only seen it on TV, but if that's somebody what we're, did not stand up, yeah. and when they were asked the question to identify themselves, if they spoke, not remain silent, spoke, but challenged the court system there and then, mm-hmm. and could come up with enough arguments to sort of be meaningful mm-hmm. to challenge what the judge was saying and because of an understanding of what you're actually trying to relay to us at the moment mm-hmm. looking at the bigger picture in that and defending themselves well no doubt any sort of uh, resistance from people would also be taken into account by laws or whatever sure. and the judge would be have some sort of recourse of action but I mean what what, what sort of situations could 
an individual resort to to actually directly challenge exactly what you're saying. All right. Well, I'll, I'll go into not that exactly. Into the trap of actually being part of the system. No, no, because it is a yeah. trap. Those two things, silence and agreement. Oh, sorry, silence and argument. Okay, are the two tools that he will use to try and get your I jurisdiction. What I'm trying to say is, can you put what where you've got to now in the discussion and everything is great. It's all in theory, though. Mm-hmm. Could you give us practical examples of how this is actually sure. expressed? Sure. Ask me. Na- ask me my name. Um, uh, Agent J, what's your name? Your Honour, I shall give you my name upon proof of claim that you have established jurisdiction over the matter pending. Good. Okay. Or. I shall give you my name upon proof of claim that there is a controversy before the court. Right, that would be really throwing it back in the face of the judge. Sure, yes. it's the hot potato thing. He's throwing the hot potato at you, and you just pass it on back to him. Because he, at that point, he doesn't have jurisdiction, right? And, and so what, what you just said then, what does it actually mean in, in layman's terms? What that means is that I will do what he's asking me to do, because you have to do what court asks you to do, because you're in Alice in Wonderland, okay, so you have to do something, you can't be silent, and you can't argue, so you're, you're left with conditional acceptance, which is your remedy, it's your private remedy, right, and so you do what he's asking you to do, or you give him something that he's asking, but on your terms, so if you ask me to stand up, okay, Please stand, I would say to the judge, I shall stand, Your Honour. However, I do not waive any common law rights, nor do I grant in personam jurisdiction. And then I stand up. So I have done what he's asked me to do without doing what, uh, uh, without getting into trouble, basically. Unconditionally. Yeah, there's always a condition. You to the judge, but you put your own condition. Exactly, on. it's conditional acceptance. Mm. Now, the judge might say to me, he might, you know, be getting a little bit aggravated by now. He might not even understand. He probably does, but he might take his little piece of paper out and wave it up and say, "What's all this about?" Okay, now what? What would you do then? Do you say, "Well, well, you know, okay, well, I don't know. It looks like you know a piece of paper, and there's some charges." If you did that, you'd be answering his question, and he's got you. Okay, he's got jurisdiction, and then it's game over again. So, at every point in turn in the road, there is an answer, and you only have to listen to what the judge is saying, because everything that the judge is saying is an offer. So you could say to the judge, um, I accept your offer to assume jurisdiction, Your Your Honour, upon proof of claim that you have established jurisdiction over the matter pending. Or, if he's asking you, what's this piece of paper about? You know, there, there are a myriad of them. I could go into you know, a great many of these rebuttals. So you could actually <coughs> challenge the judge to verify that the judge is in a position to even be challenging you sure. in a court of law. Sure, sure. And play that game. Yeah, I mean, and he could say... Well, does that not just delay in inevitable... Uh, results from this sort of interaction where you just end up really pissing off the judge. <laughs> well, you can't Not piss him really off, really. I mean, um, he, he's trying to get jurisdiction over you, and if he doesn't get jurisdiction over you, that's it. The court case is over with. Now, what we're going to have a look at in a second is actually preempting that with paperwork, which is what I do. I don't go to court either. Uh, I preempt it with good paperwork. So when you get your presentment in the mail... I either send it back as incorrectly addressed mail fraud, return to sender, or if I decide to open it, perhaps as the agent for the All Capital Letter League of Fiction, um, I, I will actually write a letter and take it in and take it into the, uh, the register of the court Okay, with my two lines. I accept your negotiable instrument for value and consideration upon proof of claim. It's a one line. Okay? Because at that moment in time, that presentment is nothing more than hearsay. It's all hearsay. Okay? A lawyer is an actor. A lawyer is a third party intervener 
into a private agreement usually, right? But they're a third party. They have no they have no knowledge of what happened. And so they rely on hearsay, they rely on argument, they rely on controversy. And until there's controversy, a judge can't step in and adjudicate. So you have to stay out of controversy. Okay, you can't you can't create an argument because as soon as you create an argument, somebody can come in and adjudicate over that. Mm. Yeah. C- can we just um, do a little backtrack and mm. just look at the the common law? Yeah. Because that's like the basis of, of like our natural rights, isn't it? It is. Yeah. That is the underlying, and there's all this other corporate legality that's been layered on top. Yeah, yeah. And it's like a it's like a layered building. Okay. And literally, what happens? You know, when you go up in that law structure away from common law, which is ground level common law, those are your inalienable rights that nobody can take away or change or do anything about. They're what they call your 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 God-given natural rights. You were just born with those. You know, you have the right to journey on the common ways of the land in your private automobile, uninterrupted, unrestricted, unmolested. Bang. That's it. Over. No one has the right to come in and step in and say, pull over, I'm going to give you a fine, you were speeding, why weren't you wearing your seatbelt? Unless you're an entity, right? And if you're an entity, forget your rights. You know, you don't have any because you've got the rights that they've given you, which has nothing to do with common law. Okay, that's one of the next, that's probably the next, that's the next tier. So when you go into court, the court steps up, okay? You've got the higher court, you know, you've got the low court, you've got the high court, supreme court. Every time you go up and up and up, you get further and further away from common law and they can't hear you anymore. Okay? So you can't bring common law into the Supreme Court. You know, where's my rights? You know, I'm challenging you know, where's uh, where's the constitution? And you'll hear judges say, you know, he'll bang his little gavel down and say, you know, if I hear any more about the constitution in here, you know, I'll hold you in contempt. Because you can't bring the constitution into this you know, upper echelon of law, because it doesn't exist. This is completely fictitious corporate law up here, you know? And it is the furthest thing away from natural common law remedy that you can get. Okay, so we, we've all got to stay in um, in our natural, I guess, our, our natural remedies down here. Okay, so we don't go to court. Well, I don't anyway. <laughs> so, I don't go because my paperwork is good enough to preempt or basically challenge them because they still don't have any jurisdiction. They don't have jurisdiction. They don't have proof of claim. Could you prove that I was here tonight? If I was to punch you right now, would you have proof? What would be the proof of claim that I was to punch you? Just other people seeing Sure, hearsay. Now, hearsay isn't admissible in court, but... Once you actually become, you know, once you actually get into an argument or a controversy and you are, are subject to, you know, the judge and his jurisdiction, it doesn't matter anymore. He will decide whether I punched you or not. If I didn't punch you and I went to jail, it would be a misjustice, right? So to say, an was, so to say for instance, there was a policeman at the door, he punched me. Yeah. He just grabbed you, chucked him in the back of the paddy wagon. To sure. Took you straight to the... Yeah. So you would put these things into practice in law the next day or something when you're in mm. court. Sure. Well, he'd Even probably take me in and lock me up. the policeman was a, a witness and he saw everything, you could still do what you're saying in court. Yeah, well, to, for, for a witness to even be heard, there'd have to be a court case, and there wouldn't be a court case if there was no jurisdiction. Okay, so, you know, again, when you went in, even if you went into the court, uh, you know, if the judge couldn't get jurisdiction over you, they wouldn't, that would get thrown out. Yeah. Because it's all hearsay. And you put this into practice? Yeah. On what? A, 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 number, a number of, yeah, more than one occasion and in more than one situation. Yeah. So I actually had to, they tried to get me to go to court for a long time for traffic, what they called traffic violations. And um, every time I challenged the police and challenged the courts, and every time I won because there was no proof of claim. They were saying that I was speeding. And I remember when, when the pirate came up to me, you know, when the pirate first tried to board my vessel, and you know said uh, you were speeding, and I, I asked him, I said, was I? 
Now, what would, what would you say? You know, most of us go, oh, I'm sorry. Bang. We enter the argument. We enter the controversy. But I don't. I, I actually take away the presumption. Okay. Oh, was I? So it comes back to him to prove that I was. Well, look at my black box. And he, you know, he shows me this thing. And I say to him, well, that's, a, that's a nice box you've got there. Because, he, again, he's trying to get me to agree. He's trying to get me to enter that controversy. And so in the end, you know, he, he starts to write out stuff. Well, give me your name. And I said to him, well, I'll give you my name upon proof of claim that there's controversy here. And he said, well, did you know that I can just take you and lock you up? And I said to him, yeah, well, that's called force. Okay? Or a threat. Or a threat. Okay? And that's what pirates do. And... Uh, all of you have kind of like grown up in the in the era of electronica. So I mean, a lot of you would would know Laurie Anderson. You know, in the 80s, she had a song called "Oh Superman," and there's a great line in that which says, "When justice is gone, there's a, there's always force," and that's true because if if I feared anything, which I try not to fear anything because fear is obviously an attractor for for bad stuff. So if I feared anything, it would be force because you know I fear ignorance. Because every time that I've sort of been in a situation where I've had to be approached by these law pirates, um, they don't understand what I do because they're not taught that and they're not taught it for a reason. Or if they are taught, they've forgotten it or they're not allowed to, to know about it. But essentially, they have their set of rules because they're policing the, um, the person, the fiction, the corporation. Okay, They're, they're doing their job which is part of the matrix. And they're, they're coming and trying to intrude upon my private journeying in peace or my private affairs, which they have no jurisdiction or no place to be in. Okay, so that's the only thing that would scare me is force because in, in all other senses, it's illegal to do, to do that, for them to do that. Mm. They, they have no right in my private automobile to pull me over, to stop me to find me, to do anything. I mean, if they said to me, uh, you weren't wearing a seat, but I would say, well, you show me the injured party. You know? There's, um, there's, a, there's a myriad of laws and things that, mm. that we, we kind of... So you have to have done something wrong for them to be able to pull you over? In their law, yeah. So all laws refer to corporations. Right. Yeah. So if you were drunk and you'd run someone down... Well, that, if I'd run somebody down, I'd most likely run down uh, an entity. And so I would be liable for the entity unless um, I was the agent for my all caps. Because, you see, you can only bring uh, a court case or a, a claim against an entity. It will never, ever, ever come against a natural flesh and blood person. All claims, all um, insurance, for example... All of those things. You know, if it even came down to it, if we were in a courtroom and I had given up my rights and the judge said, okay, I'm going to order you to pay uh, $1 million damage to this person for running them down or whatever the hell happened, and I could say to the judge, well, I, I shall pay, Your Honor, upon proof of claim that there is any lawful money in circulation backed by anything of value. Because there is no money to pay with. Right. So we, we all come back to this fictitious land again. It's an interesting, interesting kind of system. Mm. So that's the basic, that's the basis of the straw man and who all of you are. I used to be too. What I had to do is I had to go through all of my cards, all of my accounts, my uh, my credit cards, threw those away, cancelled everything, threw away my license, realised I didn't need a driver's license because I don't drive anymore. I don't put into motion a commercial vehicle anymore. I simply journey. So I registered um, and had my own private plates for my automobile. And, and anything that, that I had to actually do business with or use my transmitting utility, my straw man, say if I wanted to get an, an account with electricity or a telephone or something like that, right? You need a transmitting utility. And the same with the bank. You have a bank account. They're not going to give you a bank account in your natural flesh and blood name. Okay. So you need your transmitting utility, but you still have to be the agent for it. But I made sure that, that every time I did, 
I took away the Mr. because a fiction, a legal fiction, is not gender-based. And I always made sure that the TM, the trademark, went on the end of it. And so I slowly, bit by bit, reassembled all of my cards. And when it came time to get a new port pass, I made sure that I put the all rights reserved, you know, agent uh, signature on there. And they weren't going to give that to me. It took me an hour of, of talking to convince these people that that, that, yeah, that was my signature. An hour. <laughs> I, I'm surprised that it literally didn't take you years. Yeah, well, it, you know, I was in there for a couple of hours organising the passport, and when it came time for them to actually accept my signature, that's what took an hour. For, mm. where, where they say, sign here, and I signed, and that's when the trouble started. <laughs> so, and what were they saying to you? Uh, you can't do that. You can't sign like that. Uh, then they actually went out and researched my, my past passport from years ago and said, you know, you didn't sign like that before. So I actually had to say to them, whose signature is it? You know, it's my signature. I sign how I want. Who tells you or the government who you are? You know. So they asked me for, uh, in the end, they asked me for a proof that, I, uh, you know, I signed my name like that. And so I, I was able to pull out other documents or other things which I'd gotten beforehand, which are much easier to get, like your uh, library card or something else. And I said, look, that's how I sign my name. I'm the authorised agent for the legal fiction that happens to look like my name. And so they gave it to me. A very, very unique um, situation to be in. Especially now, because Japan has started to bring in fingerprinting. Yeah. And they're bringing in fingerprinting in America. America to completely enjoin you with the straw man. Okay? Because when you go and, you know, they take your photo... They put the fingerprints on there, it runs through the machine, and up comes the all capital letter, Mr. Blah, 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 blah. That's you. You so are. what happens in Australia when that comes in in your, in your case? Well, I'm still the agent. So it can have... That's my photo, and that's my signature, but that's a piece of IP that I own. Yeah, but will it still have your photo, your fingerprint, and that signature? Sure, as, as the mm-hmm. agent as the agent for... So adding electronic fingerprint to one of these documents has no... It's not an issue for you? Not an issue for me because because I'm still... This is a document that I'm signing as the agent for a legal fiction. Okay. Is there a separation there? Yeah, so I create the separation. Yeah. A very, very important separation because the government can come along. I mean, the government owns your house. The government, um, whether you like it or not, they they actually own a a security interest in your home. If you've bought your home, perhaps they gave you a $7,000 grant or, you know, they have like a first home buyer's Mm -hmm. grant. Or when your child is born. I know when ours was born, they gave us $3,000 because they wanted to buy a a security interest in our child, in our child's straw man. So I've I've done that for, for our child as I've actually... I've always signed as the agent for him, okay, so that he, when he grows up, he will be uh, his own agent, okay, for, for his legal fiction. Because you need the legal fiction in this commercial world to exist, otherwise mm-hmm. you can't do business, you know, you can't earn any money because they've created this whole weird fiat legal system, which, which is, you know, which is like this giant matrix. It's like a big game that you have to have a piece. Yeah to move around and play the game with. Yeah, but you can, by having a transmitting utility, you can stay out of the, the liabilities. You know? I mean, I've got, a, I've got a private agreement between myself and the transmitting utility, whereas it holds me harmless against all claims. So if any claim came against that all capital letter fiction, I'm completely, you know, I'm completely okay. That's the kind of position that I think you know everyone needs to get themselves into because at the moment you're all vulnerable. And how easy vulnerable. is it to get yourself into that position? It takes time. Probably, I'd say it would take at least three months if you started it today. You know, to go through and change all of your details on your bank accounts, uh, your uh, electricity bill, your you know, your phone bill. And what about tax and, and stuff like that? Tax is an interesting one. Tax, you know, you can challenge tax 
and taxation. However, you'd, you'd be silly to do so. You know, there are a lot of people who challenge tax and never get anywhere. A lot of people who go to jail for, for not paying tax, right? Yeah, well, well, All those sorts of people things. that you really don't want to fight with. Yeah, you don't want to kind of fight. You don't want to fight. And that's the whole point. There is no fighting. Bruce Lee said it once. He said, uh, when his master came up to him and said, um, what's the first thing that you do when you come across an opponent? And Bruce Lee said, that there is no opponent. You know, that was a very true statement. I never understood it at the time, but uh, I do now. Because if you create an opponent, then you know, you, you've got to fight it. You've got to fight it. There's no fighting. Hmm. So, is there any questions in regard to now? You all understand basically who the straw man is, yeah. and uh, we can probably move on to something yep. else. Okay, what, what should we cover next? Was that all just the straw man? That was basically an, interac- <laughs> it was an introduction to the straw man, who he is, how he got there, and, uh, and, and basically how you guys interact with, um, with the corporations and the governments. Uh, yeah. So are larger corporations or people that are very high up use this exact system to get... Yeah, it's all set up to use the all caps. It's all set up. So when I went along to the library... And the lady tried to subvert the system. I said, okay, I want you to put it in with the upper and lower case in, in my proper common English, you know, common law English name. So she did that. But it still printed it out in all caps. It, all of them, in, in every situation, I've tried the banks, I've tried the, you know, in every situation, it still comes out in all caps. And it's not an error, and it's not a, a machine fault. It has to be that way. Okay. Yeah. The United States of America Corporation... <coughs> For example, is a corporation. Mm. It's not a country. Okay, its jurisdiction is the ten square miles of Washington D.C. Okay, it's a Masonic city on its own, and that's its jurisdiction. It has no jurisdiction over the rest of the continental United States of America, but the United States of America Corporation, in all caps, with its president, because every corporation needs a president. You know, this one happened to be a bush. Uh, has no jurisdiction over the the continental U- United States and its uh, in its citizens. Mm. But of course, you know, we're all aboard that citizenship again. Yeah. But what, so wow. Uh, okay. What should we talk about? Ah, uh, very good. Very yeah. good. Well, that's that's kind of a, a bit of an overview. Mm. So let's talk about some uh, more personal stuff, like how how this might affect... Does anyone have any questions about how how this stuff would affect each of us? So have you come across anything in your life that's when, you, when you're in the situation, just you can't do something or it's just too difficult or you pose problems? Um, tax probably is the one that I've, I've run up against. Now, I initially went the hard way and tried to fight against tax. Okay, uh, I did an enormous amount of research and challenged the taxation department. And, what, and to try not to pay tax? Or? No, no, uh, to try to get the taxation department to prove that there was a, a liability between me and the taxation department. And they couldn't do it. They couldn't prove that there was a connection. And so I, not only did I write the 20 questions, that they only got three right, uh, I then produced... Um, a document based on that and I gave them the supporting evidence and I faxed it all off and never heard from them. Do you, would you happen to know or have a copy of those 20 questions? I do. I have all of those on my would machine. Would I be able to get a copy? Sure. Is there someone I'd like to uh, put them to? Sure. You're welcome. Yeah, I'll get Rodrigo to, to forward them. I've yes. got them uh, probably as a, uh, a document file so I can send them to you. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yeah, they're very interesting, but when I realised that there was no lawful money in circulation, it kind of discounted everything. You know, it kind of made it all funny to me because I realised there was no taxable event. Hmm. Anyway, so bang, there's there's one one sentence, and, and the whole lot's gone. So all that research that I did was just bollocks. Hmm. Yeah. So getting back to the credit card thing, just for a second here. Uh, a friend of mine was, was $47,000 in debt. I was $5,000 in debt before as well. So I'd known 
I, I followed the process and I got rid of my $5,000 debt. And a friend of mine said, can you do it for me? And he had $47,000 in debt. 40,000 40, of it was a home loan to Bank SA, which is St. George Bank, and 7,000 was to GE. Now, I'd already dealt with GE, and I knew what goes on at GE, and so I knew how to handle them. It was a piece of cake, right? So it took all up, I think it was around two months, to completely wipe his debt clean. And uh, in, in the beginning, he was very sceptical, and everyone, like his mother, was saying, you know, don't do it, you know, it's not going to work, it's not possible. Uh, even my parents, you know, uh, would, would say that. And, and he, I had to explain all this stuff very carefully, and I said, look, I'm not going to do anything wrong at all. I'm not going to put you into any harm, and we're not going to do anything illegal. All we're going to do is ask some questions and see if we can get an answer. So I wrote for him a half a page letter asking basically four or five questions and I'll give I can give you a copy of that that letter actually I should probably um, grab my laptop right now and uh, we'll just take a momentary break I'll, I'll, I'll grab my laptop <laughs> <laughs> so have you yes. read more and further into actually doing this uh, yeah well there's there's a huge amount of, of documents that that, um, that relate to all different sectors on this. Yeah. Because um, oh, basically, so Agent J has been st- studied this full on for oh, a couple of years to like uh, you know get a handle on it. You believe me? I did my head in. <laughs> so who did someone introduce you to this? Or? Yeah, Tristan actually introduced me to this, and uh, he sent me. Interestingly enough, he sent me this uh, this document. I forget what the name of it was, but it was by Mary Elizabeth Croft, and it, it was it was on this whole proof of claim thing and um, how I think it was called cracking the code or how I clobbered the banks, one of those sorts of things. When I read that, it just blew my head off. I was just like, oh shit, you know. I can't believe this stuff. It was like somebody had um, woken me up from this bad dream. It was exactly like the Matrix, you know? And so when I studied that, I then just went off on an incredible journey of um, having to know and research everything. So I just was downloading, 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 and studying laws and um, corporations' acts and, and all of this stuff. And I came kind of full circle. And, and then uh, earlier this year, she actually bought my CD, bought my DVD. I had a, a letter from her. And so I emailed her and was asking her some questions. And she mentioned something about a, a, a case, a court case that she was involved with. And I offered to help out. And um, so the lady, it turned out the lady who I had initially learnt from ended up asking me for advice. <laughs> and so I ended up um, giving her some stuff that she didn't know about uh, to help her out with her, her court case, which was about proof of claim and things that she didn't know about. So that was really cool, because she'd been doing it for 30 years. Mm. Now, because there's, there was something on a current affair, I can't remember, it, it sounds very, very similar, but they basically um, had a house and pl- paid council rates. Oh, yeah, I can tell you all about that one. Yeah, and they did they create their own royal family or something with oh, a king and a queen? Or yeah, that, that, that was just kind of a <coughs> bit of a joke, because you can do that. Basically, what that's what that's, that's incidentally, I think that's why the, the media gave it coverage because yeah. it was you know trivialized, yeah. Yeah. made yeah. it like a little make it a joke novelty. Yeah, and people just go, oh, yeah, sure, you can do that. <laughs> you know. They have a bit of a laugh and a bit of a chuckle, you know. Oh, look at okay, essentially, what you can do, l- land is ours. Okay, nobody really owns it as per se, right? Um, the government kind of holds it in, kind of holds it for us. Okay, until we reclaim it, which sounds strange. So what you can do is you can actually do a quick claim on on the land and go back and check all of the titles to the land, and you can actually get the original title and make sure that you own everything and there's no encumbrances, and then you declare yourself a state. Okay, so you declare yourself to be your own state. It might be the state, you can make up whatever name you mm. want to, right? 
And that's what these guys have done. They declared themselves a state because the government was denying them access to their land. And if you notice, everybody has a medium strip on their land, right? Mm. Even uh, even here, okay, certain people have been fined for parking their car with the arse end hanging over the... In their own driveway, mind you, but the arse end of it is on this supposed, you know, invisible medium strip that the council owns, okay? And you're blocking this kind of fictitious, invisible piece of land. Mm. And I'm sure that the governments make a median strip so that they control access to your land. Right? And so, anyway, this what, that's what that, um, that was all about. Mm. So these guys, you know, and just to kind of formalise it, you know, they decided to become king and queen of um, their own state. And so everyone Wouldn't can do that. Wouldn't they exclude you from taxation also? You can make up your own rules. You can do whatever you like because you become what what we all are, sovereign. We're, but, we're all sovereign, at the, yeah. at the same time, if you did that, wouldn't they be able to say, well, we're not going to supply things like power sure. and water? Sure, and so what he, what he had done is he'd actually gone and made agreements, which you can do as well. You go and make an agreement with a, uh, a utility supplier or with a, you know, a phone company and you have an agreement with them to supply something mm. you know yeah but i don't think they were paying they weren't paying council rates yep, exactly, yeah yeah okay. it's all it's all about agreements now we're going to pop back to uh these credit card ones we just open this up here it doesn't matter if we drop off on the what recording. do you think would happen if people this got out in the public and everybody started doing it would they be able to change the law you can't change laws, okay? Because we don't own the laws. Um, would they what, use what, I would, what I would be laws? what I would be afraid of, ha- of happening is of opening a Pandora's box and having subversive groups or perhaps even uh, bikies or way? you know misusing the system. Because the key point in all of this stuff is that we all have to take back our sovereignty. We have to take back our responsibility for our actions, and we basically do. I mean, when I when I journey on the on the roads, on the common ways of the land, I still abide by the general speed limit, even though I'm not subject to it. Mm. I still accept, and you know, there's a certain level of responsibility that everyone else is doing this. You know, I stop at the red lights. Mm. I do all those things because it's it's a naturally yeah. accepted kind of passage. So like, is that the fact that People out there have, have bothered to, to let's say, do experiments or tests into mm. and research what is a safe way to sure. conduct yourself. Sure. And so you're taking that as. Yeah, I, I accept. You know, I agree, basically, to to go along with that, e- even though I'm not subject to it. For example, if they said I was speeding, okay, it wouldn't apply to me. So, I generally accept. You know. The, the status quo, and by doing that, I take responsibility for my so, own actions. So, like you were saying before, the, the problem in this being is that people who aren't generally uh, we'll say law abiding, but pe- people who you know <coughs> um, go out and deliberately do the wrong thing by mm. other people. Would be out then use this yeah. to manipulate the system sure. to, to get off. Whereas sure, if they, if they studied yeah, it and knew how to do it, yeah. Yeah, yeah average person who treats other people well and mm. and isn't a bad person. Mm. So but could you go to the extreme, go out and murder someone, get arrested and use these techniques to stay out of jail? Oh, I won't answer it. <laughs> yeah, I won't answer those questions. Mm. However, wait you minute, know, wait a minute, wait a anyone like can... In theory... In, in theory... Sorry, you can't just go through all of this. Yeah. And but for those people who might be listening, out of answering a question like yeah, that. Yeah. But I don't want to prompt anyone to do anything. You can see what I'm coming no, from. No, but you've yeah. got to be clear about where mm. you're coming from. You can't sort of outline in, th- in a theory, theory like this. And surely. Then when when you're challenged at a point that's a really bit too hard, sort of duck out of it and say no. Mm. Okay. Well, in, in theory, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Mm. You could any any one of us could take a gun and go and shoot someone, right? Um, 
but it's not morally right to do mm. so. Back in the instance where you're in court yeah. and the judge was asking you those questions, you're responding in a way where that you're putting the question back on him. Mm -hmm. What happens in the end of that court session? Dismissed. He just says court dismissed, thrown out the case. Yeah, because he's not able to um, gain jurisdiction over you. Yeah, so it, uh, but you could just do a little slip up with one word and then he's got you. Yeah, yeah. You'd have to really work to get back out of it again. You know, if he's once he's got you, yeah, it would be it would be difficult. But you could do it. But um, the best way is to stay out of it, and the best way is not to go to court, hmm. obviously, with with good paperwork. So I'm going to just try and open up here. I, I guess the um, you know, if people had intent to, to you know to follow that path and initiate all the processes, um, you know, primarily for yeah, you know, let's call it antisocial behaviour. I think they'd probably find it a lot easier to do what like you know criminals, you know, corporate criminals to street criminals do all the time and just do it anyway and just use the and just get a really good lawyer to get your anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whatever. So that's probably, you know, for them easier. Just, you know, pay some money to mm. get the right actor to... Yeah. Know. Okay. I've, um, I've located the files now. I'm just going to open these up and read you something here. Now, this is getting back to the, the issue of credit card fraud and credit card debt. Now, there's no such thing as debt. I just want to make that very clear. There is no such thing as debt. This, this is a notice that I put together for a friend of mine who was in, uh, as I said, $47,000 of debt. And, uh, he received back a, a notice to say that the, um, the balance was zero after I'd finished this. Now, this is a conditional acceptance and debt verification notice. So he didn't have to get rid of his entity or anything? No. He just had to do uh, these letters? I, I basically acted as his agent. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think we did about three or four letters. Yeah. So, what I basically wrote for him was this. I refer to the default notice dated 11th of March 2006 and wish to advise that your negotiable instrument has been accepted for value upon proof of claim, which may be substantiated by forwarding the following verification of debt details within three days, 72 hours, of receipt of this notice to the address listed below. Number one. Proof of the existence of an account or contract in the actual flesh and blood name of John Doe, duly signed and witnessed by both parties, not a unilateral agreement, and upon which signed page there is reference to the entire agreement. Note, John Doe is an artificial entity, a limited liability legal fiction trademark, which constitutes valuable intellectual property, and all rights, title, and interest are reserved. Number two. Proof of claim that you are the current holder of the original above-mentioned debt instrument and that it has not been on-sold to another party. Remember I talked before about the debt being on-sold. They no longer have the right to claim. Number three, a copy of the actual accounting whereby Bank SA has incurred a loss of the alleged debt. And number four, an invoice, not a statement, for any amount of money allegedly owing or owed to Bank SA by John Doe. Now at the bottom of there I've got a disclaimer. So here are the things. Now I know that they can't provide any of those and, and these things vary. Sometimes I like to put on there as a number five proof of claim that there is any lawful money in circulation backed by anything of value because that really fucks them up, right? Can I say that on the air? Fuck up. Yeah. Hell you. There's a Sorry? disclaimer. Sorry? So you could go out tomorrow into a bank, get a five hundred thousand dollar loan, go buy a house, and then send a letter to these letters and be be rid of the debt but still have the house. We come back to force here because what they would try, what they would attempt to do is to extort the physical property away from you because there is a certain maximum of law of uh, ownership. Mm -hmm. you know, the finders keepers kind of thing. So what they kind of do in those things is they try to hire people to take away the property away from you. It's all about ownership, physical ownership of something, right? Plus, I would say that they also own the deed 
that you don't actually have the deed yet. Right. Okay, so it's a difficult situation in those sense. It would be different if you had a credit card and you'd gone out and bought something and they couldn't actually physically locate the item to try and repossess it, mm -hmm. you know, um, during this period of redemption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something but you were like saying his was a home loan. Could they not try and take uh, the house? Sorry, I think his was actually a personal loan. No, he was actually wanting to, to get a home loan. Mm. Uh, so he was wanting to you know, make sure that his credit card... Um, I guess his um, his debt history was clean, mm. and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, which is the cleaning part, because obviously once you've actually gone through all this process and no one's been able to provide you with proof of claim that there is a debt, what they do is they they discount it all, they sell it, and they report you as a uh, a bad payment, mm -hmm. right? But nothing actually happens to you. And so, so you do end up with a bad credit rating. What you what you end up with is a note at one of the credit reporting agencies that says this is a default payment, okay? Because their books didn't balance. Yeah. So what you do is you write another letter. This is the, the final stage in the cleaning side of this. You write a letter to the credit reporting agency and ask for your credit history. And then you challenge them. Okay, because they, they have no idea, right? They're like they're not even the third party, they're like the fourth, fifth or sixth party here, so they have no idea of what's either. right or wrong. So you actually challenge them to provide proof of claim. And they, if they can't do that, they have to uh, basically correct the incorrect uh, record. And, and that's how you clean it up afterwards. Okay. And if they choose not to for some reason, they just say no. Oh, so they, they can't. I mean, even a... Uh, can you challenge them and say I want to challenge you in the courts and use the same process against them in the court? Uh, you don't even need to go to court actually. Um, there, there are there are places that you can just sort of go and say, well, you know, this person is is reporting. They're not allowed to incorrectly report things like that. E even a, a debt collector, if you ask them to stop um, bothering you and they don't, every time that they bother you and don't provide proof of claim, it's instantly a thousand dollars fine. Okay, and most people don't know that either. So, uh, yeah, it's mm. very interesting. The, the disclaimer that I put on the bottom of this says, Please note, the incorrectly addressed mail shall be returned unopened and unread. Any and all correspondence from this point must be by mail only. John Doe does not authorize the recording of his voice at any time for any purpose, nor does he consent to being contacted by telephone and shall enforce his copyright rights in all instances such as copyright infringement or trademark violation. No authorization for the use of John Doe TM, all caps, is implied, granted or permitted. John Doe, all caps TM, agrees to hold harmless John Doe, the, the natural flesh and blood man, for all claims and liability under private contract between the parties. So there you have the... Uh, Mm. The complete, they, they cannot enter into that at all. And basically what you have here in these situations is a failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. Okay. So uh, we've done a number of those now and it's been successful in every time and not once have any of the credit card companies or the, uh, the legal agents or the, or the uh, debt collectors been able to provide one instance or one iota of any evidence that there is any debt. Mm. So we didn't actually do anything wrong. We only asked some questions. We said, again, here's the conditional thing. They've sent you a statement. They can't send you an invoice because there's no money, right? If you ask them for an invoice, they can't do it. So they send you a statement. And you say, okay, well, I'm happy to pay the alleged debt upon proof of claim that there is one. Right? You try and get these guys to uh, to provide proof that there is any debt. Forget it. It, it never happens. <laughs> and have, have you got any idea how many people are actually doing this? Or is I think, there I like think a there's quite a few people in America now doing this. Quite a number of people. And in America, they've got this thing called the UCC. Now, for all those people who are listening in America. Uh, which is the Uniform Commercial Code. And you can actually register your straw man using the Universal Commercial Code 
I think it's the UCC1, and you fill out the forms and you register, basically everything that you own comes under this filing, this UCC1 filing, it's an agreement, which basically states that you are the the owner of the right title and interest of, of everything that you have, including your, your straw man. Okay, so they have that system, and, and a lot of people who are onto this, this redemption thing, are doing it. They're, do, they're doing it that way. In, in Australia, we don't have UCC. I don't know what we have here. I've been trying to find out, but you know, we, I don't think we even really need to do that. You know. Um, so have you come across other people that have done it? Not many. I've, I've heard of one or two in Australia, but it's it's pretty new here. Mm. So it is it is uh, it is quite cutting edge. And why do you think it's quite new? I mean, obviously. People could have been doing this for a hundred years. Yeah, now sure. it's just coming out kind sure. of... It's information, information uh, control. The internet and sure. Yeah. I mean, we're fortunate that some people are, you know, can get information out and it, and it slowly gets around, but it's certainly not mainstream. And if it does become even remotely mainstream, it becomes a joke. It's made to look ridiculous. I heard of... I did hear of one case where some people had um, put up a sign outside of the house and they weren't paying rates because... They were going through the same process, and I think it was in Toowoomba. Yeah, it was on. It was on the yeah. foreign affair or something. And, and do so you think it's a, a good thing to get this information out? A good thing that more people do it, the better, or is it? I do now. More people are aware of it. Yeah, I do now at this particular time because of what's going on in with America and uh, the other. The whole, you know, we come into the the Bilderberg, the Trilateral Commission, all of the, the New World Order. You know, we basically whatever. People kind of say New World Order and they go, oh, and it's all like George Orwell, right? But but there is. There is a New World Order. Absolutely. Yeah. And and it's formed by all of these corporations and, and entities and, and basically all of the people who run the world. You know, all this stuff filters down through the media. There's only six people who run all of the media in the whole world. Mm. There's only six people. And I've got a map of that uh, somewhere on this computer amongst all the other stuff. But it lists all of the uh, control of the radio stations and the. Uh, mm. It's very evident, very obvious. At yeah, the time. yeah, the newspapers mm. and the print, you know, and the media. So there's only six people that actually run that. Mm. You know, filtered through those mm. six people. Mm. And we, we we probably won't go into you know, the, the the DL Abraham stuff or the, you know the uh, uh, the real New World Order stuff tonight. But that's a, that's another really big deep hole oh, that's that a huge we've been we've been huge. researching into. You know. That's a very, very st- so. At this point in time, I can see that the New World Order's plan is generally population reduction by eighty percent. That's that's generally been the consensus of what they want to do. They want to reduce the whole population by eighty percent by whatever means. Okay, but when they come around to your house and knock on the door, you know they're going to be taking the straw man away for sure because they can. Mm. They can declare a you know a state of emergency as they do in America. Over there they have this scary thing called FEMA. You know, FEMA will come knocking at your door and they'll uh, take you away and put you on a truck and they'll lock you up in a, in a FEMA facility, right? Because they can. Mm. Yeah. That's force. That's not law. That's force. Mm. Yeah. You're talking about private corporations assuming control over natural flesh and blood beings who have been misled into becoming entities and soul corporate souls unwittingly let him realize it yeah. yeah what do you think what do you think was the um, sort of the, the, the major sort of uh, first of all these common laws I mean we talk, when we saw the movie uh, V uh, yeah, V for Vendetta. Uh, Beef of Vendetta is an interesting name. And the old Bailey. Yeah. Well, what's a, it, are those laws actually um, held in a repository there? Is that the... No, the, the old Bailey in, in England, in uh, I think it's in London, was, was the place in the old days, in old England, where common law courts were held. Okay, and the old Bailey is the, I guess, the standing remnant of old law of, of the law of the land mm. and so the old bailey is has become a symbol in england of, of where law came from which i think also came from rome right because you know england was kind of founded by rome 
So in V, in V for Vendetta, now when I first saw V, I was like, yeah, this is great. Burn down the governments, right? But when I did my research, I actually found out that, that V was supporting Guy Fawkes. You know, now in England, they have Guy Fawkes every year and they burn Guy Fawkes. And why do they burn him? Because he was a Roman... Uh, he, he was actually a, like a Roman traitor. No, not not Roman traitor, but he was a traitor of England. Okay, he was a traitor of the the protesters, the Protestants. Protestant means to protest. Okay, so when you've got the Protestants and the Catholics fighting each other, what you've got is the Roman Catholic Church trying to take over England. Okay, and you've got the Protestants who are protesting against it. Now, in V, he's supporting Guy Fawkes. Now, Guy Fawkes was a Roman Catholic infiltrator into... Uh, he was going to blow up Parliament to unseat the Protestants and to reinstall Roman Catholic law. Mm. Okay? So, what V is actually about is actually a disguise of um, bringing in this corporate control under the disguise of being against governments. But, in fact... In the beginning of the film, he blows up the old Bailey, okay. And if you look at the words on the the side of it, I can't recall them exactly, but it says something like you know upholding peace or common law on, mm. on the side of the old Bailey. He blows that up. It, on the top, it's got the lady with the scales of justice, and he blows that up because he blows up, as he says, he's blowing up the symbol of what it stands for, and what that stands for is common law and the reintroduction of. This uh, this matrix, you know, and of course, the V was written by the Wachowski brothers, who wrote the Matrix. I mean, these guys, you know, have this this mm. symbology right through all of their films. Mm. Yeah. So, so these these common laws, they, they obviously must still be in there, like the oldest law books. Yeah. They're yeah. just written in ye olde English or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there must be a way to get hold of the original yeah. you know, yeah. tablets <laughs> that they were written on. <laughs> but, yeah, the, the common law, the law of the land, yeah. w- would have been very different. You know. mm. yeah. So it would be interesting to compare that to what we have now. I mean, when... People don't realise how, how America got to be where it is and what it was doing and what this is all really about. But when... America, those 13 states that split off from England right, and wanted to be their own country, okay, with their own and manufacture their own money, that's what England was fighting them over, really, was that they wanted to create their own money, which wasn't backed by gold. And the people in England at the time said, you know, if you allow a country to do that, they'll take over the world. Right, because so they're just going to have so they can just print their own money, right? It's all it's all printed by the Federal well, Reserve. They knew that England wasn't going to get any tax money from, sure. from the Americas. Yeah, so it's it's that's all like they were going to miss out on. That's what they yeah. were defending. Sure, from England's point of view. Yeah, and so you have the the War of uh, Independence. Okay, um, what was it eighteen seventeen? When was the War of Independence? Seventeen seventy six. Seventeen seventy six. That's the date that's imprinted on the Statue of Liberty's tablet that she's holding. Okay. The Statue of Liberty, by the way, is actually the Masonic uh, goddess Semiramis, and she's the goddess of war. So the Statue of Liberty has nothing to do with liberty. Okay. She's She's the goddess of war. So they went from producing money with paper to money on computers which is even more yeah well even even the money on paper wasn't backed by gold mm. so England was against that France joined with America obviously against you know against England so you've got England fighting America uh, basically over this 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 money creation thing and it all goes back to Babylonian times really it, go, it goes back to the time of uh, all the way back to the Jews and and, uh, and Babylon, you know, and and the Temple of Solomon. This stuff goes all the way back because Semiramis was a Babylonian Amazonian, believe it or not, an Amazon queen. Okay, the triple goddess, the tri-star. You know? She's Columbia. She's you know when you see Columbia pictures, she's on there holding her torch. 
And then Columbia TriStar, she's the triple goddess. She's the Masonic uh, Babylonian queen at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And what, what was the ship that the, you know, they had in the Matrix, the Nebuchadnezzar? Okay, where were they going? They're going to Zion. Yeah. Hmm. Who did Saddam Hussein think was a reincarnation of? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to trace all this stuff back to... Uh, yeah, this is all rather mythical and iconic. It is, yeah. Um, but this artificial system that we're that you're outlining and that we're dealing with, um, if it doesn't exist, whether it's the Matrix or not, humans and society have to interact on some level. What would you suggest to replace it with? What system of organisation and interaction between entities, be it real entities or virtual ones, mm. that should should supplant this system if it, if it's if it's so bad that it needs to be replaced with something? Yeah. What is the replacement? What would be a replacement? You know why why I see all of this stuff happening is because the reason that entities are created mostly is to gain an advantage in business. So IP, intellectual property, McDonald's, Coke, branding, all of that IP stuff, right, is the creation of artificial entities to create uh, an unfair advantage in the monetary corporate world. And so what this system does is it's the regulation of artificial entities. And so that that world is real. It, it, it is real in the sense that you know it, it has a life of its own. But for us to interact with it means that you know we we have to have some kind of transmitting utility. And, but to replace it, you know, I mean, in the old days there was trade, and, and a lot of people have tried to bring in trade, like barter, barter card, and all those sorts of things. They try to bring in a system where there's a fair exchange. You know, I'll give you my sheep for a, you know a bushel of wheat or that, you know, they used to have systems of, um, of fair exchange, you know. And the only time that taxes and things came in is when you had a, a liege lord, you know, who owned the land and he would, he would, you know, get you to do, you know, labour in his land and he would pay taxes for the upkeep of things. And it was apportioned, but tax is no longer apportioned. It's become this um, artificial thing, you know, so... Yeah, if we, if we were to replace it, we'd have to go back. Does it need to be replaced as well? It is another question. Like in, in my particular case, mm-hmm. my whole world and my identity is in my hand right now. Mm. I'm not actually disappointed or disapproving of that. Mm-hmm. I haven't actually. Today was the first day I actually went to a bank and got cash dollars. Yeah. I wouldn't say this year, but certainly in very very man, many months. Yeah. I run my life through my credit card, my financial life, yeah. and I'm perfectly happy with that because mm-hmm. I don't have to deal with the, you know, the cash stuff sure. or whatever. Sure. Most, and most the people fact are. that if I do it this way, the one benefit of it is that every transaction I make is automatically recorded. Yeah. I don't have to account for anything personally. I don't have to use cash. I don't have to deal with the fact that I do or do not have actually cash on me or whatever, as long as my bank account's got mm-hmm. a certain overhead in it. And mainly, all of those transactions are recorded. So when it comes time to actually deal with tax and stuff like that, the paper trail's already there. Yeah. I don't have a great sweat about anything. I don't have a great problem with anything. I can appreciate everything that you're saying. Yeah. Uh, but personally, I actually don't really have a great problem with the current system. Mm-hmm. To the system, and, and it's if, very if easy. If anything, I would somewhat object to actually spending the extra amount of overhead that I would have to invest in mm-hmm. to fight against it, mm-hmm. as you would be. I don't want to spend three months actually changing my identities yeah. because the ones that I've got, I'm actually perfectly happy with. Sure. Well, it does cause... So in other words, that's what I'm saying. What if you look at it would on be a, a reasonable thing to replace... You don't know, you can keep situation. your perfect system that you're using and that works for you. Yeah. You look on a bigger level with multi corporations that are lending out your money at 90% and the corporations are getting bigger and stronger and more control and we're staying stuck and happy where we are using our credit cards. We're stuck in a position down here mm. 
and this system could be replaced and be more fair with them not be out the laws sort of benefit them and they're getting richer and bigger and the kind of thing. Mm. And taxing your money, like the government actually taking a tax away from you and, and saying that it's using, this is the funny thing, and people kind of get up on their high horses sometimes and say, well, you know, the government uses my tax and, um, you know, it builds roads and all that sort of stuff. That's bullshit. We build the roads. The people build the roads, right? They, they don't use the, the tax money or the only thing that our tax does is it goes toward paying off the debt to the International Monetary Fund. Mm. Okay, and everything else is created by the governments as as fictitious cash, right? But we, when you hear people say, "Well, you know, oh, your, you know, we, my tax money is paying for you doll bludgers," that's not true. Uh, it's not. It's not at all. That's, that's far from the truth. So, but the government is taking your hard labour, paying you pittance for it. You know, whatever job that you know we're all doing. I mean, if you're working for fifty bucks an hour, I mean, if you think about it, that fifty, that fifty dollars or those fifty credits that you get, if you got fifty bucks an hour, and you know, not many people get fifty bucks an hour. Okay, you think about that. An hour of your time on this planet, of your life, of your life, blood and sweat, and then the government comes along and takes out. 30% or whatever it takes out of that, right? And you get given nothing. You, you don't get paid in anything, right? So you get uh, you get nothing of value for it. And even if you bought something of value for it, what would you buy it with? You'd buy it with the private credit of the International Monetary Fund. You'd be buying it with these pieces Not of paper. Not with your hard-earned cash. Yeah. Not with yours, because there is no money. All of that, all those dollars that you think are yours that might be sitting in your wallets don't belong to you. They're on loan from the International Monetary Fund and you pay tax because you're using them, right? And at the end of the day, if they said they're not worth anything, you can forget it. Now, I spoke to the bank manager of St. George Bank a couple of months back. And that and is the system that should be changed. Yeah. And, and I said to him, is there any lawful money in circulation? If I explain anything of value. And he said, well, of course there is. No. And I said, well, what do you own of value? And so, you know, he said, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I said, yeah, but... None of those things have any intrinsic value. They don't retain their value. I said, what do you have that, that retains its value? He said, well, I've, I've got a gold ring on. Right? And I said, okay, what did you use to buy the gold ring with? And he was silent because he suddenly realized that everything that we own is bought with the private credit of the International Monetary Fund. Right? And that gold ring is absolutely useless once he gets hungry. Yeah. Can't now... When you buy gold, if you go along to like a place that sells gold and silver and you you want to buy some gold or sell some gold, they're going to ask you for one of these. Right? Now, you go along and try and uh, give them one of these and see what happens. Now, I'm going to show you this. This is my sovereign identification. Pass that one around. That is the That is the most valuable thing that I have. It's, it's my sovereign identification. I created it myself. It's my photo. It's my real name. It's my real signature and my real date of birth, which, by the way, everyone's date of birth is hearsay because, I mean, were you there at the time? You might have been, but, I mean, do you know? Can you, can you actually, anyone here <laughs> prove that they were born on the day that you were told you were born? Right? So it's hearsay. Now, when you go along and buy some gold, they're going to ask you for some ID. I dropped that one on the table. They said, here you go. They wouldn't accept it. No, sorry. I said, why not? They said, we need a government ID. I said, why is that? And she said, well, we need, you know, we need proof of who you are. And I said, well, I'm giving you proof of who I am. This is who I am. I'm saying who I am because I tell the government who I am and then they issue these, uh, these second-hand documents, okay, which say who they think I am based on who I've told them that I am. So here's my birth certificate and here's my uh, here's who I am and they won't accept it. They have to have your all capital letter legal fiction because they have to do business with the straw man. They can't do business with a, a natural flesh and blood being. Okay, And so that transaction is recorded. And if you buy gold, what do you buy it with? You buy it with the... You know, the private credit of the International Monetary Fund, which isn't yours. 
And so <laughs> they can just go and take back all this stuff if they want to. Mm.